Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mike O'Driscoll, and I'm a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta. It is my pleasure to serve as your host for this afternoon's colloquium on temporality. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Given that we meet here on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and, and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all Inuit, Métis and First Nations that call this home. The University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory and the Métis Nation homeland. I invite each of you to consider the traditional lands on which you might be located and take a moment to consider the responsibilities that follow from that. We have four presenters today whose talks will be follow, followed by a response from our distinguished visitor, uh, Professor Rebecca Comey. I'll be introducing each presenter as we move forward. Following Dr. Comey's response, I'll invite the panelists to address questions to each other, and then we will open up the conversation to audience members before concluding. So let me begin then. I'd like to begin by introducing Basit Karim Iqbal, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. He completed his PhD at UC Berkeley in anthropology and critical theory in 2019. His book manuscript in progress excerpted today, which is based on fieldwork in Jordan and Canada is titled God Gives Relief, tribulation and refuge after the Syrian revolution. His other current projects include a journal special issue on contemporary Islamic political theology and another one on the destruction of loss. He completed an interdisciplinary BA at the University of Alberta a dozen years ago, taught classes there in religious studies and anthropology while writing his dissertation and began a Shirk postdoctoral fellowship there a few months before moving to Hamilton. So, Welcome back of a sort, uh, Dr. Iqbal. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, um, Mike, for the for the introduction, and especially to um, uh, to Chris Bracken and Karen Ball for coordinating these events in the colloquium, and of course to Dr. Kome for engaging us today. Um, Chris first asked if I was interested in participating in the before times uh, long long ago, and so I'm grateful to still join the colloquium uh, two years later. My, my, my brief talk today is excerpted, um, as Mike said, from a part of my book manuscript that I've been particularly struggling with, uh, in which I trace the temporality of impasse that marks my Syrian friends and interlocutors who are displaced from Dara, the city that first dared refuse life of fear under the regime, uh, many of whom now live on in the Jordanian borderlands facing Syria, where they may share the same weather with their family still inside, certainly still implicated in what happens there, where the stark difference between inside and outside Syria acts to confound and abject the work of their lives, still in shadow of the regime, although they may have physically escaped its reach. Um, and so, and so it's a colloquium on temporality, but um, I, it, what I'm, what I'm drawn to, I guess, in, in thinking about this particular, in thinking about these ethnographic scenes, is how temporality and space invert and revert over against each other. Um, recent ethnographies of, of humanitarianism, and so I'm thinking, for instance, of the work of Ilana Feldman, drawing on Elizabeth Pavanelli, have deftly mapped out the contrast between the emergency imaginary of, 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 of the event and chronic conditions of endurance, right, between stasis and crisis, um, between a flat horizon and the force of decision. But in seeking to write these scenes, I've been routinely frustrated by the lagging sense that I'm missing something, um, an inhuman or an intemporal dimension. And so in doing so, the work of Rebecca Comey has become a sort of touchstone for me, and I go back to it to help me push me further away from a simple opposition, for instance, between mourning and melancholia. Um, I had turned to two sites to help face this limit. One, a Borges short story, and the second, a Quranic eschatological figure. And as, But I still sought a language to mediate between these multiple registers. Um, 
The short story, The Secret Miracle, was first published in 1943, and it too actually opens with a Quranic epigraph. It's the verse from Surah Baqarah 256, which uh, proclaims, and it's a parable of God making someone die for the course of a hundred years, and then he revives him and says, how long have you been here? And he says, a day or part of a day. So in this parable, a man passes by a hamlet in ruins, right? He witnesses destruction and he wonders how resurrection will be possible. Um, and then he thinks he's gone, you know, a day or part of a day. And yet his food and drink are still fresh, showing no signs of decay, while his donkey's skeleton, by contrast, is crumbled. And then God recomposes the donkey before his very eyes. And then he admits, yes, God has power over all things. So this, it's a dramatic parable of divine omnipotence um, but more specifically, it's a, it's a parable of the divine power acting on time. So it demonstrates the contingency of time in which the bodies of this person, uh, exegetes name him as Ezra, and, and his donkey inhabit asymmetrical positions. So the world has its time, but God can play with it at will. So that's the Quranic verse. And then Borges take up, takes up this, this verse and inverts it in the short story. So in the short story, um, the author Yaramir Hadik is arrested and condemned by the Nazis in Prague, and then he, he uh, he's been working on his masterwork, and he thinks over this body of work he will leave behind and deeply regrets leaving it unfinished, and so he prays that he be granted a year's time to complete it. The next morning, soldiers come to take him away. They stand him before the firing squad, and the sergeant calls the order to fire, and then the world stands still. He realized he was paralyzed. Not a sound reached him from the stricken world. He first thinks he's gone mad or entered hell, but eventually he realizes his supplication was answered and that he has a year to complete his unfinished play. He does so, and then it kind of in the, in the last moment of that year having elapsed, and then his year of reprieve having ended, German bullets then strike him down. So once again, the world, ha the world has its time, but God can play with it at will. But in contrast to the Quranic parable, where Ezra was frozen out of time, here is the world that's been frozen immobile, and it's the individual's time that is extended. And so it acts as a kind of asymmetrical supplement to the life of the world. So in each version, in, or in each inversion, um, the, pedagogy, the pedagogic function of the parable and the narrative arc of the Borges short story each insist but the play of mobility and immobility folds over into another set of coordinates. Um, in in Comey's uh, Gillian Rose lecture, uh, Deadlines Literally, she writes, time both stretches and contracts. It simultaneously quickens and thickens. Time is not its own. Neither life nor death offers a stable, reliable relation to time. The other site that I turn to is the eschatological figure of the Dread Heights at Araf, which articulates suspension as a form of life. Um, and in, in doing so, that I'm, I'm, I'm maybe um, uh, kind of satirizing maybe or, or, or working in counterpoint to much of the refugee studies literature, which has described uh, displaced people as suspended out of, you know, they're, they're displaced, right? They're suspended out of space between nations and so on. Um, in this case, we have people suspended in time. The inhabitants of the heights, the eschat this eschatological purgatory in the eponymous Quranic chapter are suspended between garden and fire in the verse. Uh, and there will be a veil between them, right? Some, something is obscured. And upon the heights are men who know all by their marks. They will call out to the inhabitants of the garden, peace be upon you. They will not have entered it, although they hope. And then their eyes turn toward the inhabitants of the fire, and they say, our Lord, place us not among the wrongdoing people. So this poses a, a, a question and a problem. Who are these people? Some hold that they're those whose virtuous deeds you know, don't exceed their vicious ones or vice versa. Others say these are those who have transcended both garden and fire in the contemplation of the beatific vision. Others interpret their position as th that of those exempted from a divine reckoning because because they were children, because of other reasons. Whatever their precise identity, it's the relationship between their atopic suspension, right, out of space, and the striking lucidity it affords. They can see both garden and fire, even though they're withheld from each. 
which recalls this verse for me with reference to my displaced interlocutors in habitation of the, of the border zone between Jordan and Syria. The inhabitants of the heights, they hope and fear between garden and fire. They know all by their marks. They can read their marks, although they are themselves caught in stasis. They've already passed from the realm of the living, and so don't have any means of effecting their fate. They endure the possibility of divine relief, a possibility that is withheld, not relinquished. And so they call out to the inhabitants of the garden, um, and that's all they can do. They can only repeat those gestures. Facing the, the incapacitations of crippling inflation and suspicion in Jordan, if not outright conscription or detention in Syria, my friends and interlocutors repeat these grim gestures of their immobility. They too utter this refrain, God give relief, God give relief, seeking deliverance from whatever immediate trials or tribulations they face, but also from this structuring division of inside Syria versus outside Syria, which confounds and complicates the difference between civilization and ruin, safety and suspicion. Life at the border problematizes, it doesn't clarify the opposition between inside and outside, rather than stabilizing or formalizing the flux of everyday life, which was the older claim of anthropological realism, the eschatological dimension here releases the discipline that anthropologists uneasily inhabit after the various critiques of historicism and sovereignty. It releases the discipline toward how, toward apprehending how the homogenous continuum of time, this is again a quote from Comey, erupts into a minefield of exceptions. For one of my Darawi friends, this topological suspension elicits his return to a structured series of memory images, which I am trying to parse in this book chapter. Images of life and death, which he shows me almost every time we meet. Images which he now laces with new supplications and imprecations. His house and garden and Dara, then his house and garden ruined. His mosque, his mosque destroyed. His hadith teacher waving at the seashore his classmate shrouded for burial. His return to these images contracts the temporal distance between the scenes depicted and the viewers present. He always says, as, as though it were yesterday. Such temporal elision is, uh, is intrinsic to the visual medium, of course, and is elementary to any study of photography. But the passage of time is then registered through the accumulation of captions and his continuous return to these images. They make clear that the time of his visual archive is repeated it's punctuated across variations rather than linear, advancing in regular segments or clear breaks. Meanwhile, the captions to these disparate images and their citation in our conversation links them together within the idiom of his mourning. So temporal extension is here paired into a single binary between then and now, flattened into a spatial opposition inside Syria, outside Syria. These images are clearly neither simply traumatic nor reparative. Rather, these inversions of life and death in and against time recall Comey's Hegelian double lesson, what appears to be an impenetrable, impenetra impenetra I can't say this word, impenetrable boundary, Schanke, turns out to be a mobile and porous border, Quince, certainly, but also that the dialectic works simultaneously in both directions. Time and space become disoriented and stagnant. Again, from her, uh, from her, from her, from her essay on deadlines, um, even the river flowed backwards. She follows the logic of the limit to where boundaries are eroded, to live on the edge where language is brought to a pitch of intensity and efficacy, a splintering into an accelerating series of discontinuous and abbreviated tableau, and the paradox of intemporal witness, expressed through three versions in the Quranic verses and the Borges play, yeah, a short story, by which the absence of event becomes a negative event, what Comey calls posthumous existence. All right, I'll just wrap up. He lives, this person I'm speaking about, he lives outside Syria and has done so since 2013. But whether in Zatari refugee camp or even since he was authorized to leave it, to leave the camp and now he lives at an orphanage where, where he serves as caretaker, he's never left the border region. The orphanage building in Ramtha faces Syria. He shares his deity whether there with Dara province. The difference between in, inside and outside is sharpened, not blurred, by living on its edge. Walking 15 or 20 minutes from here, he says, I can reach the border, but I cannot enter. 
On this side of the border, there is civilization, electricity, maintained streets, and inside there is ruin, kharab, in every sense of the word. I mean, in some areas, what was there is now nothing but rubble. He himself hasn't seen this full extent of this devastation. When he left, his house was yet standing, but friends inside had sent him pictures, and drone footage of ghost cities like East Aleppo was widely circulated. But this difference in material conditions is further eclipsed by other considerations and mounting regret on every side. Those who are inside say, would that I had gone to Jordan, and those who are in Jordan say, would that I would retur could return. Others leave for Europe, and they regret that as well, especially when it splits families apart. So as it is lived, the contrast between inside and outside can't be thematized into the opposition between ruin and civilization. So he contrasts ruin and civilization, and then he confounds the difference between them. What conditions actually allow for flourishing? The answer is not available from within the spatial frame of inside or outside, because the destruction of Dara's towns and villages is met by a consuming regret that hollows out whatever security is found. What is ruined by the war is, though, is not only the external neighborhoods and the shelters, but the internal topography as well. He frequently cites a different Quranic verse, truly God alters not what is in a people until they alter what is in themselves. And then the second part, and when God desires ill, evil for a people, there is no repelling it. And apart from him, they would have no protector. No refuge from the divine decree, except in the divine decree. He would shake his head inside, outside. All right, I think I'll stop here but, um, and maybe we can come back to some other points in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Iqbal. Our next co-presenters will be discussing temporality and the philosophy of Leroy Little Bear. Matthew Wildcat grew up in the community of Musquachies and is a member of the Erminskin Cree Nation. He's an assistant professor of political science and native studies at the University of Alberta. His current research, the Re Relational Governance Project, looks at how First Nations create forms of shared jurisdiction with each other. Corey Snellgrove is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. His research deploys the insights of modern and contemporary political theory, indigenous critical theory, and social theory to understand the problem of settler colonial domination alongside indigenous peoples' alternatives to it, especially indigenous treaty visions. He's interested too in the role of social theory in not only understanding the reproduction of structural injustice, but in identifying the possibility of shared interests to ground solidarity. Doctors Wildcat and Snellgrove are both members of the Prairie Relationality Network. The network leads the Prairie Indigenous Philosophy Project that seeks to increase access to the works of esteemed Indigenous intellectuals, whose output is often located in shorter works published in many venues over multiple decades. Wildcat and Snellgrove are part of the editorial team of the forthcoming Essential Works of Leroy Little Bear. Matt, Corey, over to you. Great. Thanks, Michael. And um, thanks to uh, Christopher for the, uh, the invite. And um, yeah, we'll just let's get right into it. So um, Leroy Little Bear is a Blackfoot scholar from Kainai First Nation, otherwise known as uh, the Blood Reserve in present day Southern Alberta. His scholarship now spans uh, six decades and covers an incredible breadth of topics um, from legal philosophy to Blackfoot metaphysics. Uh, and notably, he was part of a, a, a key figure of a decade long dialogue between indigenous elders and natural scientists, uh, in part captured by Little Bear's forward to the physicist uh, David Bohm's book on creativity. So Little Bear's work primarily focuses on revealing uh, indigenous ontologies. Uh, and here, Little Bear, when he uses the term indigenous, he moves uh, kind of fluidly between uh, Blackfoot specificity, Plains indigeneity, and global indigeneity in uh, what I would call an unarticulated uh, sensibility. So it always seems appropriate in the situation, but he never quite explains why. <laughs> so um, Little Bear primarily discusses uh, indigenous ontologies through a comparative analysis um, with Western ontologies, uh, here employing uh, the specific terminology uh, of cultural difference or the language of cultural difference. So alongside many others, Little Bear also draws a distinction 
between a focus on time in the Western tradition and a focus on place in indigenous traditions. So those familiar with uh, Glenn Coulthard's Red Skin White Masks may recall his use of Vine Deloria to make the time place distinction to help set up his reworking of Marx's concept of primitive accumulation to focus on land instead of labor. Yet Little Bear also has a very compelling understanding of time that revolves around the concept of renewal. So sort of pushing on this distinction between time and space. So for Little Bear, Little Bear, renewal lies at the heart of how existence is maintained through ongoing repetitive processes. Renewal has an epistemic component that has to do with internalizing knowledge through repetition. And we would invite people in the audience to think about this in conversation with a passage from Dr. Comey's recent talk, where she draws from Marx to think about the process of learning to practice revolutionary freedom as analogous to learning a new language. Uh, Comey uh, states, but repetition is also the best way, perhaps the only way past a certain age at least, to learn a new language. And repetition can also be a way to unlearn an old language. So um, here we're going to cite a fairly lengthy passage that we've taken from uh, Leroy Littlebear's, probably his most famous work, Jagged Worldviews, um, colliding to contextualize how renewal is central to his um, understanding of Indigenous thought. So uh, I'll get Corey to to uh, put this in the chat. So um, all things, um, so this, yeah, I'll, uh, and I quote, uh, all things are animate, imbued with spirit and in constant motion. Uh, in this realm of energy and spirit, interrelationships between all entities are of paramount importance and space is more important referent than time. The idea of all things being in constant motion or flux, uh, interesting to hear uh, flux in the previous talk, um, leads to a holistic and cyclical view of the world if everything is constantly moving and changing, then one has to look at the whole to begin to see the patterns. Creation is a continuity. If creation is to continue, then it must be renewed. Renewal ceremonies, the telling and retelling of creation stories, the singing and re-singing of the songs are all of humans part in the maintenance of creation. So if I, you know, within this larger flux, renewal allows the flux to be held together uh, is a, a, another kind of short way of saying it. So, for Little Bear, Indigenous institutions are also connected to renewal. Indigenous forms of life are characterized by internal rather than external forms of social control. And he, talk, he does talk about the police here uh, specifically, um, that social order is maintained without you know, a police force, right? And so in this account, there was no legal or political form separated from the activity of members that enforce conformity with values. So here, Little Bear, he has this um, quote, uh, law is the culture and culture is the law. And here I want to take exception um, with that, uh, but then draw out some of the complexity below. So I think we should take exception with this, uh, the simplification of the statement, law is the culture and culture is the law, um, as it has the ability to, I think, reify Indigenous societies and give those um, the ability to have claims to cultural authenticity that's able to trump processes of dialogue and contestation that are required to create indigenous institutions in the present. And I think this is uh, particularly important in light of the concerns of indigenous feminists on how heteropatriarchy is woven into the fabric of indigenous nations today. So, you know, we wouldn't want culture to be the law and, and law to be the culture. But uh, notwithstanding this concern, uh, Little Bear does offer a very sophisticated account of how internalization of knowledge creates collective goods that, reford, that refuses the subordination of individuals to the collective right, and, and allows their, their interplay. So here, Indigenous societies reproduce modes, of, and in Little Bear's work, Indigenous societies reproduce modes of life through incentives of good behavior that accrue to those skilled at collective living. But this form of collective living is also tempered by a high value placed on individual choice as well. And, and you know, people sometimes speak of this as the primacy of conscious that individuals should always be able to um, make their own decisions. And so this is also occurs within the context that uh, Little Bear speaks to of the importance of being a generalist. So uh, what can also be read as a form of self-sufficiency that you have uh, an understanding of, of um, all the necessary um, everything you need to, to maintain economic independence. And this undercuts economic coercion within Indigenous societies. And I think very importantly, uh, Leroy Little Bear argues that within uh, this interplay between the collective and the individual, diversity is the norm. So deviation from acceptable behavior is minimized. So 
um, redescribed using the language of Western philosophy, we may say little bear understands freedom to include the independence and the negative value of non-interference, as well as interdependence and the more positive values of sharing and creation and the su sustenance of good feelings amongst one's relations. But all of this, this ways of internalizing, you know, what it means to live uh, in concert with others has to be done through renewal, through this repetition of, of, uh, of knowing, you know, not just the values of society, but also having that economic independence as well. And so while renewal defines in part cyclic, cyclical philosophies, Little Bear argues that it's not, it's not a static concept. So he says, uh, certain regularities that are foundational to our existence must be maintained and renewed. And so as to leave open the potential for change. Uh, and so as uh, he also puts it, uh, what was once necessary to maintain those foundations may longer, no longer be necessary justifying change. So uh, for, in Leroy's words, for uh, indigenous peoples, um, never claim regularities as laws or finalities. The only constant is actually change itself. So in Little Bear's own work, almost every piece repeats an overview of this comparative analysis of uh, indigenous and Western worldviews. Uh, and he does this across five decades and it's actually, um, it, it becomes quite tedious to read uh, in fact. And so when we met with him in the fall to discuss the essential works, um, he, perhaps anticipating our confusion about his constant repetition of this, you know, this comparative analysis, um, he began by discussing the importance of this rep repetition to internalizing knowledge so that we come to memorize and gain fluency over what he's sharing. And, and so in other words, um, renewal provides the basis for thinking about time, I think in this instance, from a, from a cyclical standpoint rather than from a, a linear standpoint, as you might say. So temporality has been a concern for Indigenous peoples um, before, but especially since this collision uh, we call colonization. So the colonization driven, uh, this collision, sorry, driven by geopolitical rivalries and profit was and often remains justified through a particular temporal sequence that we have come to refer to as Eurocentric theories of progress. These theories of progress often rested on another invocation of temporality. Societies with history were seen as superior to those without, those stuck in nature and so doomed to repetition. So repetition, renewal, stasis, inferiority. So while deploying a civilization or a cultural distinction between linear and cyclical, Little Bear's work interrupts and transforms this series of terms. So in his uh, 1977 essay, A Concept of Native Title, which was submitted to the Berger Commission on the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Project uh, that proposed uh, a natural gas pipeline from Northwest Territories to Northern Alberta, Little Bear not only offers one of the earliest legal interrogations of Canadian claims to sovereignty and an intervention into a conjuncture we remain very much defined by, uh, he also invokes a sense of what Amy Allen calls progress as imperative, a trades on the possibility of learning and transformation. Although he draws on the difference between linear and cyclical philosophies and how this relates to different concepts of property, his own position invokes temporality in his hope for Canadians to learn to change. So he writes, when it comes to a consideration of native title, many authorities reason that Indians have no concept of property ownership and therefore could not have title. This is nonsense. It is time the federal government and the courts stop using as premises false reasoning such as personal and usufructory right dependent on the goodwill of the sovereign for stare de Sisi's sake. At one time, reasoning such as were forward in the St. Catherine's Milling and Lumber Company case may have held water and we can at least give them the benefit of the doubt but we know better today. We claim to be one of the most advanced societies this world has ever known. It is time to put our intelligence to work in a way that will do justice to that claim. So Little Bear's mode of comparative analysis between indigenous and Western traditions must not be read statically to reify or manage metaph metaphysical distinctions, but rather as an entry point to critique. Little Bear invokes a different sense of temporality to critique the idea that treaty represented a surrender. Ownership for indigenous peoples, he argues, was to the past, present, and future generations. No crown negotiator received a surrender from the dead and yet to be born. A point made manifest in the tradition of indigenous resistance to dispossession. When Little Bear describes what treaty means from an indigenous perspective, he's not doing so to point to difference in interpretations and then stopping, but rather to illustrate the correct interpretation. The juxtaposition is critical then, inviting transformation. Indigenous treaty 
in, in, sorry, indigenous treaty negotiators thought Canadians shared the values of wholeness, strength, sharing, kindness, and honesty. Uh, and the point of drawing attention to this expectation is not to highlight the failure or not to highlight the failure alone, but arguably the hope or even imperative that we, they could become this. So again, we can invite a conversation with Professor Comey's work here on blocked or derealized possibilities, missed possibilities. The irony though, is that the institutionalization of cultural difference frameworks that Little Bear has done so much to advance is that they have missed the critical function of comparison that can be seen when we examine his work closely. And a key part of that is temporality uh, and change. So that's our, our presentation. Great, thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I, I, we're mid, as we're midstream here, I'm struck by the richness of the conversation, um, you know, informed by attention to a particular theoretical uh, concept or question uh, across multidisciplinary fields. And oh man, this is the reason I love theory. Um, so uh, let's let's move on. Um, introduction, I'm gonna introduce Karen Ball now, who is currently uh, a professor of English and film studies, specializing in literary and cultural theory at the University of Alberta. Uh, her many brilliant articles have appeared in journals such as Cultural Critique, Research and Political Economy, Differences, New Literary History, Journal of Holocaust Studies, and so on. She has written extensively about Leo, Leotard, Freud, Derrida, Arendt, Kafka, Hayden White, and others. Um, I've been fortunate enough to present alongside Karen on a number of different occasions. Uh, she has guest and co-edited special journal issues of trauma and its cultural after effects, visceral reason, cultures of finance, the global animal, and most recently with Stefan Madisic, a special issue of cultural critique on pornocracy. Other publications include an edited collection titled Traumatizing Theory, the Cultural Politics of Affect in and Beyond Psychoanalysis, and a monograph titled Disciplining the Holocaust. And I think um, from this catalog, you get a very rich sense of the diversity and intensity of Karen's theoretical work. Uh, Karen, over to you. Okay, can everybody hear me? All right. Well, um, I, I decided to play with PowerPoint <laughs> and <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I am not very professional at it, which might give you grounds for hilarity that I didn't plan on, but feel free to laugh. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, I, um, I've also got my talk written out because I tried to time it first and it might be a little bit longer than 15 minutes just to warn people, but it's not much longer. So Karen, at the moment, um, your, the paper of your talk is, is blocking the okay. uh, PowerPoint. So okay. what you'll wanna do is uh, stop sharing screen and go back and select just the PowerPoint itself. Okay. Uh, yeah, don't don't share the full. Uh, yeah, no, I was wondering how that was going to work, but um, let's see. Okay, so that means I just click on my PowerPoint and then do share screen, or uh, no, um, hit the share button, okay. and then when you get the whole bunch of different things, just pick the PowerPoint and not oh, okay. the desktop. As you do that, I'd like to compliment you on your corgi on your screen, and and I'll take that as a as a personal gesture as a as a corgi owner. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, no, it was meant for you and Cecily. So, um, all right, so uh, you presumably you just see my uh, PowerPoint now, according to yep. the instructions, and not my my actual talk that I'm going to be reading while I'm doing yep. the paper. Yep, we're good. Okay, great, great. Uh, simultaneity. <laughs> that's, a, that's a motif. <laughs> All right, so the inspiration for this talk derives from a trace of the initial conversations that took place in the spring of 2019 when I was uh, beginning a distinguished visitor application to bring Rebecca to the University of Alberta, and uh, she told me she was writing on the deadline. Um, and um, when uh, Bracken and I were talking about activities that would take place and uh, came up with the idea of a, a you know, a colloquium on temporality. 
I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll revisit some of my favorite ideas um, that seem to be resonant with the issues presented by the deadline. And um, hopefully what I'll say is not horribly or always already obvious to everyone. There's a way in which it's always already obvious to me. So, um, okay, enough caveats. All right, there are three, um, there are three subtitles. Um, that aren't really subtitles, they're more like motifs. Um, uh, there's a, a wider project that this falls into, which I, I referred to over the last 25 years or so as the entropy archives or entropics, uh, using the thermodynamic notion of, of entropy, but also you know the Pynchon's use of entropy and crying of lot 49, it's sort of borrows loosely from both of those, those figures. Um, the Entropics Project encompasses everything. It's a theory of everything, <laughs> um, well, which is why it hasn't gotten finished because <laughs> everything continues while posing a, a very personal question. How do I tell the difference between narcissism and depressive alienation generated by my confrontation with capitalist modernity? Is it really me or is it just me? Uh, the motif of depletion um, between proto-fascist toxic masculine narcissism and the critique of capitalist modernity via the philosophy of, of temporality. Um, and the third is a mystery, I hope maybe to solve for you today as to why Professor Ball rubbed hair gel into their arm last Sunday, uh, which falls under the rubric of distended versus intentional time. <laughs> Okay. Um, at first thought, you might rightly assume that my leveling down title alludes to the Heidegger of being in time. And certainly this concept will serve as a departure point of sorts. Drawing on my memory of being in time bolstered by a 2011 entry composed by Michael Wheeler from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I recall that leveling down emerges in the analytic of Mitzayn where Heidegger identifies care's three dimensions as thrownness, projection, and fallenness. Okay. And uh, here's, uh, you know, I, I actually have most of my talk in, in slides, so it should be easy for people to follow, especially since the ideas are so easy. Um, it is, a, is the third dimension that is crucial to the motif of depletion, since it refers to Dasein fa falling away from itself as an authentic potentiality for being itself and, and as fallen into the world. Wheeler in uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia writes, such fallenness into the world is manifested in idle talk, roughly conversing in a critically unexamined and unexamined examining way about facts and information while failing to use language to real, reveal their relevance. Curiosity, a search for novelty and endless stimulation rather than belonging or dwelling, and ambiguity, a loss of any sensitivity to the distinction between genuine understanding and superficial chatter. Each of these aspects of fallenness involves the closing off or covering up of the world, more precisely, of any real understanding of the world through a fascination with it. Wheeler um, writes that what is crucial here is that this world obscuring process of fallenness fascination is manifested in idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity is to be understood as Dasein's everyday mode of being with. In its everyday form, being with exhibits what Heidegger calls leveling or averageness, a being lost in the publicness of the they. Um, and then Wheeler has also picked out this, this quotation, which I put up for you. Um, in utilizing public means of transport and in making use of information services, such as the newspaper, Every other is like the next. This being with one another dissolves one's own Dasein completely into a kind of being of the others in such a way indeed that the others as distinguishable and explicit vanish more and more 
In this inconspicuousness and unascertainability, the real dictatorship of the they is unfolded. We take pleasure and enjoy ourselves as they take pleasure. We read, see, and judge about literature and art as they see and judge. Likewise, we shrink back from the great mass as they shrink back. We find shocking what they find shocking. The they, which is nothing definite in which all are, though not as the sum, prescribes the kind of being of everydayness. Okay. Um, the they self coalesces as a foil for Dasein's authenticity as a regulative idea. What Theodore W. Adorno called the jargon of authenticity or Eigenlichkeit in German comes to the fore here in the Eigen root. In the English translation, this root comes to us in the modifier own most to indicate how, as Wheeler writes, my authentic self is mine owned by me. Whereas the inauthentic self is the fallen self, the self lost to the they. The authentic mind self is hereby opposed to the inauthentic or fallen they self. Um, as Wheeler observed, citing T. Sheehan, fallenness is not an accidental feature of Dasein, but rather part of Dasein's existential constitution. It is a dimension of care, which is the being of Dasein. So in the specific sense that fallenness, the they self is an essential part of our being, we are ultimately each to blame for our own inauthenticity. Okay, so here, here's some of the so-called lessons I want to I want to take from from um, this discussion of fallenness. Um, Martin Heidegger's authenticity rhetoric might be read as a narcissistic lament. The public they displaces and depletes authentic me by leveling down my uniqueness, including my resoluteness in the face of my own most, own most death. In German studies, it has strongly been suggested that Ernst Jünger's total mobilization influences, influences the, sorry, influences certain strains of Heidegger's understanding of authenticity. Channeling proto-fascist Jünger, I claim that I am most authentic when I'm facing the barrage of war in which I must genuinely, instant by instant, confront the imminence of my own most death. This proto-fascist and existentialist motif in Heidegger plays out in his elaborations of being toward death and resoluteness. Yet it also raises the question as to whether or not authentic me is a narcissist diminished by mitzine, care, and ecstatic time. The other's affects are always already too much for an authenticity claimed at the expense of they that makes ethical and other demands on my compassion and concern. Though his contemporary Adorno hated the square-headed Nazi for good reason, another interpretation of leveling down would bring this, this figure into conversation with the Frankfurt School criticism of ubiquitous reification in capitalist modernity. Co corporate metrics homogenized and quantified time rendering it abstract in Marx's sense. More hours, more meetings, more better. Corporate metrics propel entrepreneurial behavior to fit ungrumbling into grids, to perform smooth assimilations, to be obliging, to efface myself in performing being for others while promoting my sacrifices and my work to score points on annual reports. Capitalist spatio-temporality enjoins lateral task orientation, move quickly, serially, and efficiently from one task to another. Whenever possible, multitask. My self-sovereignty is evinced as I master simultaneity and master ecstatic temporality. From the standpoint of capitalist leveling down, we might ask whether or not a professional demeanor is a they self that entails a resolute, even-handed self-effacement on behalf of the other, or even the denigration of the other as TMI. 
Well, uh, Walter Benjamin's Freud sketches another angle. It, how has, how has moder modernity changed us? It has created little vesicles under siege. A barrage of stimuli, fleeting experiences that have been neutralized of their shock, displays collective experience that integrates the present with tradition. What happens to the experience of time under these conditions and increasingly the barrage of simultaneous demands identified in Jonathan Curry's 24-7. Uh, okay. Catherine Rudolph contends in her two, 2006 article in Differences that August, Augustinian insinuations in phenomenology via Husserl and Heidegger nurtured linguistically turned motifs that become overt in Derridian deconstruction of the metaphysics of presence. Her article leads me to revisit Paul Ricoeur's threefold present via Augustine's book 11 of the Confessions, a commentary Ricoeur carries out in the first chapter of the first volume of Time and Narrative. According to Recur in Book 11 of the Confessions, Augustine is provoked. Augustine is provoked by the idioms of for representing time to pose this apparatic question. How can time exist if the past is no longer, if the future is not yet, and the present? It, let's see, sorry. How can time exist if the past is no longer, if the future is not yet, and if the present is not always? Augustine writes, what, is, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I want to explain it to someone who asks me, I do not know. I can state with confidence, however, this much I do know. If nothing passed away, there would be no past time. If there was nothing still on its way, there would be no future. And if nothing existed, there would be no present time. Ricoeur traces the meditation on this question through the threefold present as distentio, distended temporality, temporal consciousness and Husserl maybe, ecstatic time in Heidegger maybe, which Augustine locates in the soul. My present is distended between a present past and a present future, between memory and expectation. There is no pure present, therefore there is no full presence of the present as self-presence and absolute self-sovereignty as such. For recurs Augustine, eternity is the departure point for distended time as a distinguishing feature of fallenness. In relationship to an originary Edenic moment in which humans enjoyed unmediated intimacy with the divine, time since the fall is fallen time. As you will recognize the ingredients of Derrida's deconstruction of the metaphysics of presence under the rubric of ontotheology abide here. Let me differentiate then between Ricoeur's conception of distension further. Distentio, distended temporality, is distracted temporality and flux time is contrasted with the ideal of a sustained presence of mind, intentio, as the impossible figure of a mind held still, almost forcibly, as Augustine's language implies. I would add that the other of extended time I would add that the other of descended time is not just eternity, but intentio, intentional time as the object of ontotheological fetishism. In secular modernity, Heidegger's own most me and intentional time take the place of eternity in the Augustinian model. A longing for the immediacy of the divine transfigures into a longing for self-presence in the present, for stillness, for sustained concentration. The real me is supposedly present to itself for itself in the present, an impossibility from the standpoint of difference. 
Yet narcissism and a puritanical work ethic polices the boundaries of this possibility and denigrates the lesser thans of mental presence, the unprofessionals, the failed interpolates of the office world. Okay, now you guys know what the ending is. <laughs> um, from a narcissistic standpoint, any distraction from real me intentions is a depletion of real me. From the standpoint of a lament about capitalist modernity as a stage of ubiquitous reification, fallenness from intentional time is a sin that must be punished with puritanical reproaches. Or didn't you get the email? Didn't you get my email? Didn't you? The experience of flux time the experience of flux time, the other of intentional time, the time to task is denigrated through its contrast with intentional time. The time of self-sovereignty, ontotheologically conceptualized as the presence of mind or as presence of oneself or oneself in the present. I'm sitting outside in a rocking chair on a sunlit deck that is fissuring at the seams. It was not built correctly. Distracted by memories, distracted by anxious anticipations, I inadvertently underline unimportant sentences and recurs time and narrative. I glance at my Twitter feed and read, is it just me or is it just me? I look up, Kafka has caught a vole and carries it in her mouth toward inauthentic flux time me distended between the no longer and the not yet. Returning to recur, I read him quoting Augustine. But if only their minds could be seized and held steady, they would be still for a while. And for that short moment, they would glimpse the splendor of eternity, which is forever still. I look up, Zena is batting the bull's corpse across the deck and in the air. I read Recur quoting Augustine again. If only men's minds could be seized and held still, they would see how eternity in which there is neither past nor future determines both past and future time and it feels like a repetition. Who or what perpetrates the seizing of the mind, I ask? Is the longing for stillness death-driven? Is leveling down a defense against the barrage of stimuli? Contemplating this question, I look up and notice that Zena continues to play with the vole, which has in the meantime been relieved of its head. I read, the theme of distension and intention acquires from its setting within the meditation on eternity and time, an intensification that does not just consist of the fact that time is thought of as abolished by the limiting idea of an eternity that strikes time with nothingness, nor is this intensification reduced to transferring into the sphere of lamentation and wailing what had until then been only a speculative argument. It aims more fundamentally at extracting from the very experience of time the resources of an internal hierarchization, one whose advantage lies not in abolishing time, but in deepening it. I extrapolate. Eternity is a limiting idea for Augustine that exacerbates the temporal fissures of a distended soul. It festers the suffering of the fallen, melancholically longing for the immediacy, fulsomeness, and simplicity of a lost presence that never existed. I extrapolate. Heideggerian authenticity means keeping in mind the ever possible imminence of my own most death. The ineluctability of death is a limiting idea for the project of a fundamental ontology, which paradoxically cannot think the whole of being as such because it cannot think of death. I extrapolate. Presence of mind, intentional time is a limiting idea for a thinking subject. Benjamin's little vesicle subject via Freud's trauma theory is always under siege in a capitalist modernity that extracts labor in the form of abstract time, thereby alienating and depleting me, internally hardening protective me against the stimuli barrage and the shock of a stranger's gaze. My mind is seized by this idea. I look up and think, I need to stop reading to write my talk, but at what point will I dispose of a headless corpse again? <laughs> is it just me or is it just me? <laughs> and this is from the analytic of Kitsign. 
Thank you so much, Karen. That was wonderful. And uh, we appreciate the insight into your backyard experience, as gruesome as it may have been. Um, our respondent today is, of course, uh, Professor Rebecca Kume, our distinguished visitor in the Department of English and Film Studies over the past two weeks. We've had a fabulous opportunity to get to know Professor Kume through her presentations over that time, as she's moved us from thinking dialectic tragedy and revolution in Hegel's aesthetics and post-Hegelian thought to a consideration of Marx's 18th Brumaire, as she tracked the evisceration of the revolutionary subject and the disappearance of the form of tragedy itself, to finally her town and gown lecture on Samuel Beckett's Endgame, and the dramatur dramaturgical indices of the end of theater and its political implications as we move from worst to worst. Uh, Rebecca, it has been an honor and a pleasure to witness the unfoldings of your work in progress. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we're delighted to listen to you again as you respond to today's panelists. Over to you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me, am I on? Yes. Um, well, this is a, this is a real treat just to sit here and listen to the four of you. Um, and um, I, I think what I, I'm trying to, I mean, taking this all in and, and thinking about how these, you know, these, these talks, these presentations sit together in such an interesting way. Um, I thought one thing I could do um, just is, is really I'd love to hear you all talk between the, between you all. So, so one, one, one question I had listening to you all was um, thinking of some, some possible questions that might, you know, strangely connect your talks, but also um, make them somewhat, not necessarily discordant, but, but, but somewhat, somewhat different. Um, and I guess one, one question I, one starter question I guess I would like to throw it for all of you in some way um, is to pick up on um, what Karen was dwelling on um, at several points in her talk, um, thinking about how the, you know, to what extent um, a reading of Heide Heideggerian, you know, the Heideggerian version of, of what many people call homogeneous empty time and other people will call whatever, but how that, you know, that, that, that apparently, you know, static, empty, uniform, um, but one also might say spatial and in, in a, in a kind of bad way, <laughs> time might, might be, you know, but might be profitably um, interpreted alongside or with Marx's analysis of Marx's labor theory of value, basically, where the where, where time itself is um, time itself is, is is shown to be not a not a natural given at all. It's a it's a historical shaped and shaping force, um, and it's capitalism that you know numbers literally numbers our days in in all the ways that it does. Both you know both sequentially, but also um, imposes, you know, very unnatural ends to those days. Um, so you, you, Karen, were, you know, it seemed to me you were, you were in, invoking a kind of Lukacian, so therefore contemporaneous with Heidegger kind of um, model of abstraction and, and fetishization for understanding this. And so I'm wondering um, if we can, if we can take over, take on the category of capitalist temporality within a, within a global context. And if globalization has, is just a, a ramping up of that kind of, um, that, 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 that mode of abstraction or whether we're moving into, you know, a, a different model of value production and that means temporality um, itself. And if that might make us think about entropy um, as well, perhaps not simply metaphorically, but also, you know, in terms of just all the very concrete planetary issues that are um, literally plaguing us. Um, and so carrying this over to the other, the other speakers, the other topics, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if we could um, hear, you know, um, if this, 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 the question of globalization seemed to be kind of in the background of Corey and Matthew's talk um, as and, and capitalism was certainly not in the background it was it was you know the the quite the issue of resource abstract extraction um, is 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 inseparable from the issue of 
colonialization and, and, and capitalism is right there. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to hear, um, I want to hear more about it as, as specifically, you know, about the, um, you know, the so-called binary, you know, between so-called Western and so-called indigenous um, modes of thinking about time and space. And you, you, I thought you, both of you, you know, really um, did that, you know, thought about that in a really interesting and historical way about, and, and um, you know, whether that's the question of how, how, you know, to what extent are these universal categories? Um, and you moved, you know, you moved back and forth between some very specific, you know, articulations and, and then and, and, and some some generalities. Um, and a question I had, which is connected us to what extent is the category of the indigenous? I mean, is that's a retroactive product of, you know, of globalization itself, correct? Um, and so in, in some sense, this very opposition itself is, 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 is an opposition which um, is, you know, among other things is, is retroactively produced um, by global capitalism to have an other against which to, well, you know, to plunder basically, but against which to define itself. Um, so um, in this regard, this is, this is a sub, you know, this is a substrand of this question. Um, I really, I really um, learned a lot from your, um, you know, from your discussion of Big Bear and the way in which, you know, he, 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 as, as you were glossing, you, you were talking about his like endless re repetitiveness, which i found very funny. Um, but then how that repetitiveness itself, you know, it has a, it is among other things, pedagogical. So there's a kind of, there's, there's something deeply, um, yeah, it's a stra it's a strategic. Let's just say strategic repetition, right? And and therefore, and it's it's not going to be the same thing every time, obviously, because it's being repeated in a, at a different moment. So it's 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 changing. Um, but to what extent do you think um, the the uh, once um, once quite generative language or strategic essentialism might be you know might be helpful here? I mean, it's a, a term, a concept that you know doesn't seem to be in huge circulation at the moment, but I'm just wondering whether it might have a, have a kind of function. Um, so a, re, a, you know, a kind of reclaiming of, of, of an identity, even while, you know, in the context of, um, you know, of a genocidal effacement of, of that identity and so on. But uh, at the flip side of that, as you, you kept pointing out his own, his seeming um, references to, um, you know, Western um, models of, of progress and, and so on and so forth. And you, you hinted at the form of his, of, of his writing. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Um, you talked, I mean, I, I got the re re repetitive nature of, of the form and how that might itself, you know, be, be part of this, but, but also, you know, for, you know, do writing for writer who writes in so many different registers, an academic government works, you know, it just there's so many, there's so many different contexts, you know, including the university and different venues of publishing, how, how this, you know, how, how this, this formal, um, there's a kind of formal, maybe collision is not necessarily the word we want, but there's a, there's a, there's a multiplicity of, of genres and mediums and, and therefore temporalities you know, it seems to me, um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about, about that. Um, now, connected to this, which might, um, which made me hear uh, Matthew and Corey's um, talk um, after hearing, you know, following on Iqbal's talk, um, it made me, you know, which, which, um, which made us think so much about space and time and the, you know, really the impossibility of separating them in a certain way that the, you know, time, time is experienced most acutely. Um, I shouldn't generalize, but I'm just going to for the time being, you know, when it becomes a, when, when, when it actually becomes a spatial barrier, you know, I mean, that's when you, you know, when you actually, when, when time, you know, a temporal, a temporal divide seems to, you know, shatter space and keep people inside and outside, you know, the door closes and 
the moment has passed and you're, you know, you're, you're literally, you know, you're literally foreclosed. Um, but the, 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 you know, um, the opposition between space and time should not, does not imply that space is something static or time is something static. I mean, the, 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 the way in which, so, you know, progressive, you know, empty Western time has always been criticized from within that tradition is that it's spatializing, right? This is Bergson's critique of, you know, of, of spatial time as being just all about, you know, the coordinates along an axis and countable, measurable, et cetera, et cetera, time. And so the, all the images of, and basically all the images of time we have, you know, as, as a line, as an arrow, as a ladder, you know, as, as, as extended, as, um, before and after. I mean, these are all these are all spatial determinants. So, so, um, so, is the difference is the opposition between space and time, or 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 um, both? You know, or, or between a reified version of both. I mean, both space and time become equally reified by the same token, and part of the, you know, part part of the way in which time is colonized is by colonizing space and they're, they're, they serve the same purpose. I mean, that's how the globe was, you know, that's how, uh, you know, that's how time was standardized. It was standardized by, you know, by virtue of carving up the, the globe into its longitudes and latitudes. And well, anyway, you know all that, but so the, the, my point is just that, that this, 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 this kind of um, measured, meted out, distributed time, um, which is a you know which is one of the key instruments of colonization is is inseparable from the carving out of of space. Um, so do they stand and fall together? I mean, does the does the emancipation of time, if that's what we that's what we're trying to think about, is it possible without um, a complete reconfiguration of spatial relations? And somewhere this is. Um, yeah, this is um, for for um, now um, specifically um, for Iqbal now I think, but I don't I don't think it's actually just exclusively for Iqbal. But the the you know this kind of painful um, you know hypertrophy of of, of inside outside, um, which you beautifully show to be you know the 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 binary itself is the is is the trap you know that there could be something on the other side is is you know is the very thing that keeps um you know that that that, that maintains this stasis and produces this paralysis but as does i would i heard hinted in your comments the idea that between that inside inside outside duality which was really a nothing you know is this is this might be this deeper duality like if we get out of that place you know let's go to europe or let's go to america we'll be out of that so you know just defers the defers the uh you know this the split um which would you know which might be a function of of which might be a function of this of this whole thing i mean these these internal borders and i'm just thinking moving the other direction i'm just i cannot help you know when i when i hear about these borders just think of of, of you know of, of palestine and how the way in which the the inside and the outside you know that you know that that idea of a border is you know is one can even imagine that it's separating you know separating two 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 uh, political units because the, you know the space if you just go to the west bank and you know there's just the, the internal by the eternal partition and bifurcation which is a extreme temporal one because you literally cannot get you know from one place to another within the same so-called territory so we have this, you know, this multiplication of of, um, of, of borders, which become both spatial and, and temporal. Um, and so, thank you. This, these are just such scattershot thoughts. So forgive me, but this was a, an amazingly rich um, concoction. I just want to invite you guys to to come back in here. Well, I'd, I'd concur that this has been amazingly rich so far. And, and at this point, I'd, I'd encourage any of the panelists to, uh, to respond to 
uh, Rebecca's comments um, or to address questions uh, uh, to each other or clarification, let's let's open things up between uh, the five of you a little bit. Um, and uh, I'll invite you to uh, to to further elaborate on your ideas if you'd like in response to Rebecca. Uh, I was hoping that Bazet could uh, put up that quote, one, the, the quote, the quote from Borges. Um, you had a couple quotes that, that I was hoping we could look at a little bit more carefully, um, it, like in the chat. I mean, in the chat. Can you? Would you be willing to do that? Okay. <laughs> but um, one of the things I, I, you know, I was thinking about, and and it. You know, it goes back to the beginnings for, for me of, uh, you know, my education as a graduate student or maybe the mid, mid part of that time. Uh, I was, I was, you know, work, my supervisor was uh, Jochen Schultesasse, who taught seminars on Kant and Hegel and popular narratives and German aesthetics and psychoanalysis and um, and I took them all, <laughs> except I missed the Hegel seminar, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but um, I was all, I did a special a special um, session with him on uh, narratology, and that's when I started reading Recur. Uh, and what one of the rich ideas I was taking from Recur, which also gave me a certain leverage with reading Heidegger, was this notion of the limit idea. Um, and, you know, I translated the, I translate the limit idea, or I always understood it as a, as a, a, at least um, intra, intra subjectively as a regulative idea, you know, so the limit idea becomes a regulative idea. So the limit idea that, that, um, that recur posits on behalf of Augustine is the notion of eternity, um, which becomes a thing that was lost. Um, and um, that is impossible for mortals who have sinned um, and therefore have destroyed their, their intimate relationship with Yahweh or whatever you want to call that, the, that person or being. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, what um, both of the, the talks, uh, both of the talks before mine, um, you know, touched on in, in different ways is, you know, that there's, the limit ideas is obviously different for different communities, but also in different moments and different spaces. Uh, and so once you once you have something like a wall, um, you know that you, you're already you're already looking at two different temporalities. You're looking at two different notions of what I call intentional time and flux time, distended time. Um, and maybe there's something like you know, maybe distended time is something that that is aligned with uh, being, you know, facing necessity in instant by instant, so that there is no space for something like intentional time, right? If if survival is really um, is really uh, you know uh, under siege, um, like you you know, if you move from a place where there's heat and warmth and light and food and water to one that doesn't have those things or has them temporarily or provisionally, um, then you know your relationship to um, your own sense of intentions um, and the temporality that goes along with that, whether you feel disrupted or not, will will obviously change. Um, and and so you know there's this you know there's a privilege of intentional time, right, which is which is what it makes makes it so desirable, perhaps, especially for academics <laughs> um, who get interrupted in so many different ways, including by um, by uh, uh, murderous kitties. Um, <laughs> you know that <laughs> that uh, you know it, the, the, this privilege is something that isn't 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 something that people necessarily hold up hold up as a limiting idea in all spaces and all times. Um, and maybe there's another kind of limiting idea that comes into play in those in those flux time dominated spaces, um, but maybe maybe not. Um, and and so you know that was one of the things I was curious about when you know with with um, Bazet's juxtaposition between Borges um, and you know the 
you know, the situation with Syria, um, you know, especially given what's happened with Ukraine in the, in the meantime, you know, I've been, I've been caught up with watching news and just thinking all the times, every time I sympathize with the Ukrainians, I think, but, you know, how much did I, you know, how much was I present in, you know, how much presence of mind did I have in attesting to and feeling sympathetic with the Syrians and how much presence of mind did I have, have I had with, you know, Yemen, you know, and places that have been more or less off the radar um, in terms of imagery, like the, you know, we've seen a lot less imagery in some of the mainstream news venues, right? Um, but with Ukraine, we're getting a lot more imagery. And, and so the emotional reaction is, is, of course, going to produce another set of spatio-temporal effects. Uh, but, you know, I, I've had this sort of emotional ambivalence because every time I think, oh, you know, I can't, I can't, it's hard to imagine what it'd be like to, you know, not only lose your home, but lose your entire city and have it be completely demolished and then to be, you know, hiding in a metro station and, and not worried about when you're going to get some water and how are you, how are you going to get out? And then all those people that I didn't think about because there, I wasn't getting barraged with those stimuli. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's again, the, the, the question of, um, you know, how many, how many temporalities are we inhabiting every day? Um, you know, between, between the moment of, of feeling for others and the moment of trying to survive as a self, uh, um, you know, and that's why I've always found Benjamin's, you know, rereading of Freud as very valuable. It's almost like it's, it's an allegory for the modern subject. Uh, you know, the subject under barrage, you know, a barrage of stimuli that develops this hardened cortical layer. So it's more protective and defensive than receptive. Uh, and uh, um, anyway, that's just, that's some, a jumble of thoughts. <laughs> Rebecca's used to my jumbles. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in for a bit. I, you know, um, I, yeah, no, I'm, I, I think in a lot of ways I'm realizing that um you know, this kind of whole developed like architecture of like talking about temporality and time is, uh, you know, a bit beyond me. And so there may be a little bit of talking past each other, but I, I'll, I'll do my best to try to like make some points of connections. But, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about a little bit is like, you know, time is connected to like pain and suffering uh, and how that is kind of like a when I'm hearing the other panelists and uh, Dr. Kome talk uh, of, you know, the, of like temporality is a is a mechanism for, for which to think through the world's hurt, right? And um, for uh, Little Bear, um, you know, I would say temp like that time is a way to think about the wor the world as like a good place to be in, you know. <laughs> That's actually the main way he I think he's trying to get at it and. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking about that because it, it was actually something my, uh, you know, I have a new son and it was something my dad said recently about like, you know, you want your kid to think the world is a, is a good place to, that, to live in, right? Like that's, that's, what, that's kind of your goal as a parent, right? And that was, that kind of struck me as like, you know, almost, um, you know, potentially open to a bunch of critique of like, but the world is full of like, oppression and like these structural injustices and like, you know, how could you, you know, what is it to, to think of that as you're being your primary goal as a parent to raise your kid to, so that they think the world is a great place. Right. And, um, but I, but it really helped me kind of like think through what Leroy is saying. Cause like, and he's like, what is the ideal, like kind of personality type? And it's like someone who's, you know, easygoing, takes the world as it is, is open to like change and, you know, doesn't get like too concerned about, you know, anything and like, um, you know, and, and so it, and some ways I wonder if there's like a really kind of divert, like divergent uh, um, thinking about it a little bit here and, and um, thinking through like, you know, what is it to internalize for Leroy Renewal is used to internalize not just the values of society, but to internalize a set of understandings about the world, which allow you to exist easily within it, right? And so, um, 
the, the other thing I wanted to say was um, just thinking about like, uh, you know, I guess the whole other, like come from an indigenous studies standpoint, the, the whole other way you, we could have talked about this is something um, pointed out by Rebecca in terms of like, you know, the concept of indigeneity is like a, a concept of modernity, right? Like it's a, we don't have the concept of indigeneity unless we have like globalization and then indigeneity in a part uh, as a like a legal political concept has to get produced in order to respond to pull together a set of claims of people who have been affected by col by colonization and globalization in a in a specific way but then like you know if I went out to Muscogee's and I was talking to some you know people who run sweats every week and you know who are like who maintain ceremonies for people and like you know are who in many ways I think would describe themselves as traditionalists they'd be like but but yeah these things are ancient and you know being indigenous is an ancient art <laughs> you know it's a, it's an, to be indigenous is an ancient practice right and so you know they would they would probably take exception with the idea with an understanding of indigenous as being a modern phenomenon right and um and and like in in particular the like this concept of renewal for um, like when L Leroy says like, you know, the practice, like, um, it's about, you know, you have to do the ceremonies and these different rites, like you have to repeat them, right? For him, he's like, if you, if Indigenous peoples aren't doing all of these renewal ceremonies, the world will fall apart. Like it will, you know, existence will start to come apart at it seems. Like this is like, for a lot of people, really serious, um, really serious stuff. But I, but it, you know, this idea of being, of indigeneity being at once more like a product of modernity, but then indigenous peoples thinking of it as ancient, like even using terms like time immemorial, right? Like for as long as we have, humans have memory. Um, you know, I think we shouldn't be too quick to um, dismiss that there maybe is something to indigeneity that's held together by more than just modernity. So like, you know, um, I have a paper on indigenous relationality with Daniel Both coming out and he said, or in it, we look at these two quotes and they're separated, one's in Australia, one's in Canada, they're separated by about 40 years, but they both say like the exact same thing in regards to resource extraction and in Canada, you know, Philip, like this is a quote from Redskin White Masks, the Squitchin leader says, you know, if you wanted to build this pipeline to help out the poor people of the world, then yeah, we would have to think about as Dene people, we would have to say, you know what, if this pipeline is for the benefit of the poor people of the world, then we got to think about doing this, you know, but this pipeline is for rich people. So no, we're not going to do it. Uh, and then in Australia, this woman, this is like right after the Mabo decision, which recognizes Aboriginal title. Um, and they're asking her about the importance of land. And she says, you know, if somebody came to our land and said, this is the only place we can dig up this one mineral. And this mineral is like vitally important to do these things which are just are necessary for life in these other parts of the world, then yeah, we would probably say, sure, why go ahead, come dig it up if you if you really need it like that. Like, yes, come dig it up, you know? And, and it's just like, there's a, there's a, mode of under like a, a mode of reasoning about relationships there that I just is like so starkly similar that I I wouldn't want to I would never give up indigeneity as being just something of modernity either right and like a yeah and so I guess yeah I'll leave my comments there I think you're muted Rebecca. yeah I know can I just can I just come in really really quickly Dante Demelis I just want to clarify it wasn't yeah I, I sorry if I if I um suggested what I didn't want to suggest that within indigeneity was a product of modernity and was the reactive um, category at all. I, would, I, was, I was referring specific to the way in which um, we construct, that, that these, these binaries get constructed, you know, that the very, you know, that the binary itself is already, you know, is already within, within a certain logic. That's, that's really all I was, my only point, not that the, not that the indigenous was a, you know, was a somehow a colonial term or category. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would understand it. Can you hear me or am I muted? Yeah, 
Yes. Okay. I would understand it as sort of like, you know, for others, for self, right? And and so when you know you have empire, then empire invents its other and creates a category for that. But you know, that doesn't mean that this that all the people that end up in that category didn't have a for self uh, understanding, which, you know, isn't necessarily a, a coextensive with the category that was imposed on them, right? And, and so, you know, when people talk about things like the invention of Africa or Saeed talks about Orientalism and, you know, there's, there's the imaginary and then there's, um, and then there's the way in which, as Fennell says, you know, how do people develop this for self relationship? Do they, you know, they have it before um, their displacement or their colonization, but but then they also have to reinvent it, you know, in in the in the after during colonization or in the aftermath of colonization. Um, so you know, those things there, it, you know, none of those things are static. Um, but, you know, I, it, it, I guess I would say that, you know, can we say um, that the, the people that had their land taken away, were they thinking before those people came, before those other people came and took away that land or, or populated it or colonized it, if those people who, whose land was expropriated said, oh, before that happened, I'm, I'm indigenous to themselves. Um, you know, if that, you know, that's, you know, that's how I understood this notion of indigeneity being a kind of a product of, of colonization, you know, um, it's not the same thing as to say that, you know, indigenous people didn't exist before the term, you know, so um, it's just that the, you know, how do we understand that, can we place that category outside of, outside of its history? I would say no. <laughs> Maybe I can, I'll, I'll jump in um, as slightly uh, separate context, but one thing I was struck by reading um, Little Bear's work was the way in which the cyclical worldview was very like dynamic and responsive. Um, change was built into it. It was able to tap into the need for change. And I was really struck by this in comparison to the linear worldview, which as, as we sort of draw, drew attention to, some people describe it as space versus time, but then this sort of linear worldview, the Eurocentric Western Euro worldview, like I think you could just look at something like climate change and that there's no conditions to learn. And so one thing I thought that was interesting about like Leroy set, setting this up was there was something about what are the conditions in which, um, obviously change happens in both of them, but there's something about like, um, and I'm also I'm reading or I was reading Rahel Yagi's work on criticism of forms of life, which all talks about learning processes. And there's something about the form of life that is linear that it also cannot list, cannot learn about itself almost. Um, so that was something I was thinking about. Um, kind of different to the strategic essentialism. Um, it's more like the, the, the worst Western worldview is an essentialist worldview that can't um, change substantively, I guess. Thank you. If I can just uh, jump in as well. I, I had a question um, earlier, actually, for uh, for Karen, because she brought us to um, to to Benjamin's reading of Freud and talking about flux time being denigrated through its contrast with intentional time and so on. I, I was wondering uh, whether I was wondering, I guess, how um, Benjamin's account of distraction ends up factoring into your reading of entropics more generally, um, and whether that, um, you know, whether different media forms also, you know, I guess, open up a different kind of conversation there. I, on on the on the the quote from Borges, I tried copying it into the chat, but for some reason I couldn't uh, uh, couldn't um, uh, control V it in. Um, but uh, but but it, it's from his short story called a secret miracle um i was gonna say also so so um in in thinking about so in in dr Kwame's comments um you, you you very rightly pointed out you know that, that between the inside outside duality right that there perhaps there that there lies nothing but a nothing which he also takes us to right uh, the person I was uh, describing his account of 
uh, his his kind of compulsive return to these memory images, his account of um, the difference between inside and outside Syria being sharpened in this way, but then that difference itself being hollowed out, where um, it's it, where he's unable to locate you know safety on one side and suspicion on the other, or ruin and civilization that these positions then become interchangeable. And you pointed out that there might be a deeper duality um, there as well. In um, in in some of the the um, material that I didn't uh, get to today, um, I I try to explore a little bit about how you know. So he, he's it's after the revolution, but before any kind of substantive relief. And so the 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 mortified horizon of that orphanage in this North Jordanian town, it's it's lined with these images of days gone by and companions who have passed. Um, and and so it, the, the the place of such border life becomes an intermediate zone uh, between uh, this is uh, in in Stefania Pindolfo's words between the possibility of regeneration on the one hand and the elasticity of the destructive drive on the other and so it's no longer simply one between and suspicion or ruin on one side and civilization on the other. I hear children running up the stairs. So sorry if the microphone picks it up. Um, and so and so that kind of border life, maybe it exposes a kind of um, extimate life that's, again, still quoting her, that's always lurking and comes to be exposed in trauma. Um, Pandolfo then goes on to, to write that this return to an inorganic state beyond the subject and beyond life, it resonates with the broader project of Lacan's ethics seminar, which he, de he describes as seeking the point of view of the last judgment. So in, in comes the eschatological dimension again, um, to provide a different kind of account maybe of, of what this, of what such extimate life might, might, uh, might offer, or might provide um, in, in the border zone. Um, and so between be, between the possibility of regeneration, which is not simply relinquished, um, no, uh, between that possibility and this elastic, this elasticity of the destructive drive, instead, there's a kind of, the suspension structures his return to his memories. And so um, mourning, this is a, again, a quote from, uh, um, from your essay morning work and play but morning this becomes the infinite circularity of mortified awakenings and revived mortifications still kind of reading benjamin um, in a different way so th these these repetitions they don't generate a new dialogue they don't provide a kind of revolutionary politics um, but they also don't simply abandon one to a kind of ruthless pessimism and so when you were talking about the possible emancipation of time um, and does does time do time and space stand and fall together? Um, I'm not sure what 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 space r remains for emancipation writ large. There are still practices of gentleness, and we were saying care earlier. Um, and so, partly what I'm end up trying to do in the chapter is is follow some of those practices of gentleness in the space of the orphanage that don't herald a kind of you know, grand emancipation, um, nor do they try to solve the problem of inside or outside, um, but they also can't escape it. So ultimately, uh, there's this moment, there's this way that anthropologists hide behind their ethnography, there's this moment that, that um, in which this person, you know, as part of his compulsive return to these images at one point, he said, you know, there are so many things I miss about Syria, which is, you know, 10 minutes away. Um, and that much I heard him say before, his friends, you know, who had been killed and his house in ruins and his family and so on. Um, but ultimately, he said, you know, in the end, you know, thank God for the blessing of forgetting. And so forgetting there becomes po one possible emancipation of time. Um, but uh, it's not one that comes without without cost either. Thank you so much for that, Pazit. Um, we're coming up on 20 minutes before the hour. 
And I'm wondering if we could perhaps open this up to audience uh, comments and questions as well too. Um, and I'll invite the members of our audience uh, to come forward and contribute to the conversation. And you can do so in one of two ways. Uh, you're welcome to raise your hand, um, in which case uh, we will uh, allow you to speak alive to everybody in the room. Um, or if you would prefer, uh, you can uh, enter a question into the Q&A chat. Um, and I will relay that question to our panelists. Um, and so while we wait on folks to come forward, um, I actually had something that uh, I wanted to invite. One of the things that struck me um, in our um, discussions was uh, the use of the term flux time in both Karen's presentation and in Matt and Corey's presentation. And, and of course you're quoting Leroy Little Bear in that case. Um, and and I, was, I was quite struck by that because um, on the one hand, in, in Karen's case, we have an instance of flux time as something that is besieged by um, disciplinary um, capitalist mechanisms of oppression and uh, domination. Um, and, um, and on the other hand, flux time in uh, uh, Little Bear's estimation is something that, uh, to quote back the quotation you offered us, leads to a holistic and cyclical view of the world. Um, if everything is constantly moving and changing, then one has to look at the whole to begin to see patterns. And I was so interested in, in the, uh, the term leads to. Um, and, and what uh, either of, of you, Corey or, or Matthew, might think it is being suggested there, what is, what is the relationship between, between flux time and the uh, engendering of, of that holistic view? Is, is it, is it, does it necessarily lead to it? Is, does flux, is, is, is that holistic view a way to manage the vicissitudes of flux time and its impositions? How, how, how is that? Because in some sense, what I'm seeing between those two is, is, is analysis and cure potentially, um, or perhaps um, something more like um, uh, uh, some rapprochement between an understanding of the disciplinary mechanisms of colonialism and the disciplinary mechanisms of capitalism that were the more proper subject of, of Karen's um, complaint. Matt, you're, uh, you're muted right now. Like when Lyra uses the term flux, it like, it, it, I'm, um, so I, I'm just quite certain it's different than flux time as being used by the other panelists, which I gather is just like flux time is, is when, you know, it, it, it's, um, of chaos, right? I guess, uh, you know, like, like you find yourself in the midst, in the midst of disorder. Um, and so for Leroy, flux is not um, disorder. What the flux is, is that, so if everything has, is animate and has spirit, it means we're connected or related to all of existence, right? And, but what happens with um, all of existence is that you, um, be, you know, it, it, it is chaotic. It's, it's disordered. Like there's no, there's, um, it, it, it's, there's just so much going on. Uh, and this is kind of where like his part of his scientific um, stuff, like uh, dialogues take place is like, you know, he would say, even like the physicists, they'll say like, if you get down to like the level of like quirks and quirks, and then it's like chaos theory where you never know where like a single particle is at any time. And it's like, you know, the, that it's just a probability that a particle is where it should be in, in that moment, right? And so like, you know, that's kind of what he's getting at with flux, but then what holds the, um, what holds everything together is that we do renewal we, and we repeat, and then that gives order to things, right? And, and, um, and so what allows us to see the larger order of things is to take a step back and not look at any one individual part or component, but to see about how components are related and connected to each other. And then through seeing all those connections, like in a bigger view, once you start to see like patterns of regularity, that's what allows you to see how things are held together. And, and so that's what 
that's what um that's how like renewal and flux like fit together right they're like um they that's what like holds the world together i guess <laughs> in a way uh and so yeah i think it's just like a different way like a, just a, a completely different use of flux Thank you for that clarification. Karen, I see you've unmuted. Did you want to add to that? You know, I think Bazit also used the term flux time. You did, yeah. You? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, thank so you. All, so all of us did. Um, and um, we should have also coordinated on what we wore, I think, if that would have been, <laughs> would have been at least fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I it, you know the because the two other presentations were using also using this this category uh, uh, it made me think about all the ways in which flux the the valuation of flux flux time or the denigration of flux time shifts depending on what your limit idea is right so if you know maybe your limit idea and maybe the the notion of the limit idea isn't as useful in this context um, as it is in, you know, obviously recur who's invoking it. Uh, but, you know, if creation is your limit idea um, and you define creation in a particular way as, as welcoming of flux or it's, you know, constitutive of flux, then you would value flux time very differently than you would as, as an academic who's always already interrupted. Um, you know, <laughs> or as somebody who's always, you know, being is being disciplined into having one one block of intentional time after another, <laughs> with all of those po possibly interfering with each other, nevertheless, right? Um, and uh, or like if you have kids and you're trying to get writing done, you know, it, it, there's there's all this navigation that occurs so that um, the flux time of survival and being in the world doesn't you know you could block off intentional time for yourself where you concentrate on your thinking or your reading or your writing um so it's the, you know that was one of the more i'd say benign notions of of intentional time that i i felt like i was i was at least contemplating but um, you know, it's obviously, it's also, you know, a, a sort of privileged binary, you know, it's a binary that depends on a certain privilege. But then there's the other kind, which is, um, you know, which I thought of often when I, when I've read Heidegger in the past, which is, you know, this sort of toxic masculine, like, I'm working, you know, and you're all interrupting me and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm being toward my own most death and, you know, I'm resolute in the face of, the, you know, of that, of that uh, approach and that imminence um, and this, this fetishism of resoluteness, right, which, mm. you know, is, has, has a certain kind of legacy in, um, in uh, the idea of like stoic impassivity, right, um, and, Heart, you know, at least acting as though one's own emotions don't affect one's ability to carry out certain kinds of work and, um, and, or, and maybe even, you know, noble sacrifice of sorts. But um, there's a gendering to that, to that, that fetish that, um, you know, I'm finding myself increasingly um, demoralized by and enraged by. Uh, so, so, you know, on the other side of it too, the, the disciplinary, the disciplining of, of time, um, you know, that is capitalist and workplace oriented and, and also, you know, how to survive in modern life when your house might flood and you you have to teach and all that, that kind of stuff has made me rethink my relationship to intentional time. So there's a way in which, um, you know, I'm valuing flux time a little bit differently now. Um, you know, the, and that's where the analytic of kit sign, <laughs> kitty sign comes into play. It's, you know, I don't know what kind of temporality cats have. They know when they want to have, be, they want to be fed and then they often disrupt me and start destroying things. Uh, but they also um, don't seem to have this, this binary, right? So there's something joyous about that, um, which then brings me back to what you were saying about the notion of creation as a kind of, you know, regulative idea um, that organizes uh, not just your relationship to time, but your sense of happiness in the world. Uh, and, you know, that's, it's the ability to have an absolutely non-transactional relationship 
to, to flux, um, that it negates that, that kind of transactionality. Uh, and that, that's part, that, I think that's a part of it that I, I, I um, sort of melancholically uh, <laughs> find myself inclined toward, um, even as it seems like it, it might be more of a, a, you know, an effect of aging than anything else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. We have a we have a couple of questions pending, but before we turn to those, I just want to invite Corey or or Basit to to add further to this question if they like to. I'll just maybe say something really quickly on this. It seemed also that for Little Bear, that the flux there is referring to it's a bit it's positive, right? It's a positive versus Karen's uh, discussion of it in a negative sense, but I think it's also positive in the sense it's speaking to a, like a, a good form of interdependence. And I think part of the reason why like the flux that Karen's speaking to might be to put it simply like a bad form um, speaks to like this, this interdependence that isn't in a, um, that is a bad form of it. I don't, I don't know if that's, I'm just trying to think through the, um, the way time also maps onto those questions of interdependence or, or flux does too, but that's probably neither here nor there. And here I was just hearing this horrible echo of flex time every time I heard flex time I was kind of shocked oh my god <laughs> they've invaded our, our flex time too by, by making it into flexibility <laughs> we have to work all the time <laughs> terrifying yeah. prospect thank you Rebecca Abbas, anything to add or should, should we move on I was just going to say that, 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 that it's, it's possible that this kind of the possibility of a non-transactional relationship to flux you know could then be you know, a, a, an approach to uh, distraction that isn't always seeking attention or something, you know, to pass beyond, you know, to, to transact with the, with the distraction to find a better attention or something. And so that might be one way to, uh, that, that, that I was hearing the work of art essay in there. Thank you. Uh, Chris Bracken has a question. Chris, uh, uh, please go ahead. Um, first, thanks for this amazing panel. Um, this has been a really great talk to listen to from really a kind of globalized perspective. Um, so I have a long version and a short version of this question. I'm going to go with the short version. You can thank me later, but I hope it's one that everyone can speak to. So what is the relation between animism and entropics? Because it seems to me that we've been talking about a time that renews and comes back and recharges. And Matthew and Corey also made the astonishing, in the context of Western European metaphysics, claim that stories, the telling and retelling of stories is necessary to sustain creation. And we have an entire university built on crushing that idea um, where we're speaking now. Um, and then we have this other time that wears us out and wears us down. And I can't help just, I'm looking at a computer, I can't help looking at the news uh, President Biden yesterday freed up 180 million barrels of oil. We have this notion that energy is always about, you know, throughout my life, we have this idea that everything is always about to run out and energy especially is about to run out and we won't be able to move anymore. And of course, Heidegger, when he talked about care, was fundamentally giving us a model of the anxious subject. And I often tell undergraduates, my task as a humanities professor today is to constitute you as subjects of anxiety of economic anxiety. That's what the university and the surrounding community want me to do. And then finally, I thought of Hegel and his circle of history and his allegory of the sun and the introduction to um, the lectures on the philosophy of history. So my neighbor's kid has a little car, which doesn't run on gas, but it's just outside the window right now, making a lot of noise. Um, and there's this moment in Hegel's introduction where he's following the sun of history from the Orient to the Occident, and he wants to keep it shining over Germany, France, and Britain, but it's moving towards the Americas. And then he wants to actually, he realizes at a certain point, oh my God, it's gonna go back to Asia again because it's going in a circle. And then he tries to put up his arms and like a biblical figure, stop it in its tracks. So I'm just curious if you could comment on that, this, this time that renews and this time that wears us out, because what I'm hearing from many of you is that we're caught in this hell time that is wearing us out. Anyone who'd like to, to go ahead. 
please. This is just quickly, and it's mostly just a throwaway comment, but, you know, um, uh, this was um, something from Karen's talk of, um, you know, how like metrics or like indicators, measures, right, are, is like something like this kind of oppressive fashion to it in our in our present context. And, you know, when we, when like I, the primary of my, the most of my um, academic work is actually just on institutions. So this is like, like I do like pretty boring institutional stuff most of the time. And a lot of times indigenous organizations are like metrics, all these measures, this is all like Western constructs. And part of me, I'm like, yes, but you know, also, you know, prior to settler colonization, you needed metrics or you would starve. <laughs> you, need to, you need to, you know, produce everything you, of life you needed. And if you weren't keeping track of that, you, like things would not go your way and and and, act, and people did starve you know <laughs> like that like this was a you know a, a part of life and so um i do i think about um for me i always never try to get too distracted by i shouldn't be saying this in front of michael but uh, i never try to get too distracted by the the metrics of the university i don't really think about them a whole lot and i mostly think about like well, what for me would, what do I value of like how I would spend my time? Um, and, but also like, how do I measure that in terms of outcomes? Like it's never just for its own sake. Like it's, I do think outcomes are important, but I, but partially I feel free to be okay with, with creating outcomes because I'm like, that's what I'm here to do. You know, like this is the, this is part of the, it, I should be sharing my ideas with others through outcomes, you know, so. Hold on. And no worries, I'm out of the admin game. So you can say whatever you want. <laughs> don't, don't tell anyone that I don't think about the metrics too often. <laughs> uh, any further comments? And we'll, we'll take one. I have one final question to relay, but I'm happy to hear further on Chris's uh, intervention here. Well, you know, I, I want to, there's something that Chris said at the beginning of his comment about, you know, which almost seemed to set up entropy in opposition to animism. And, and um, you know, I actually sort of feel like I, I'm oscillating between those two, two poles because entropy is something I garnered from Freud and Benjamin, you know, this idea of this, this monad that um, is being barraged by stimuli and then it develops this hardened cortical layer in order to defend itself. But as a result, it, it kind of loses certain kinds of energies. Um, and, you know, animism is a way of, of it, one could potentially read it as a way of, of retrieving energies or discovering energies and, and things and, and, you know, forces in, in the interaction among things. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's more, it, there's a sensory aspect to it, which is, again, non-intentional and, and non-transactional, because for me, intentional time and, and transactional um, value systems sometimes go hand in hand under the rubric of discipline. Uh, and uh, um, so, you know, there, once in the throes of animism, it's almost as if one becomes timeless, right? Or, you know, is trying, is, is you know, one is trying to experience a kind of timelessness uh, because, you know, the end points and beginning, the beginnings and endings of things are, are moments um, that aren't, aren't bound to some sort of outcome that is necessitated by either survival or a boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it doesn't, it's not a depletion of, you know, it doesn't, one doesn't experience it necessarily as a depletion. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the one comment I guess I would, I would make. Um, maybe we could hear I, from our English visitor one more time. <laughs> that'd be you, Rebecca. 
<laughs> Still <laughs> trying to figure out the unmute. Um, I, I, I'd love to join in. There is a question in the chat in the Q&A bar that's been there forever. I'm just wondering. Yep. And, and I'd very much like to just squeeze that in before we conclude. But uh, if you if you have anything else to add at this point, you feel free to do so. Or I can turn to that nothing, question. Nothing that's just not very gloomy, so maybe not. <laughs> Okay, let me let me relay uh, as as a last point for a quick quick relay. Um, uh, Will's question here. He he writes. I'm not sure about temporality, but at least time is a concept that is dealt with both by the sciences and the humanities, but in different ways. Borges, Little Bear, and the Heidegger Freud Benjamin constellation here all implicitly broach this issue. So I'm curious, what's the role of science, or maybe I should say scientific knowledge, in these various engagements with time? What's the role of science in these various engagements with time in anyone's estimation? I'll let someone else go because um, if Will's on campus, I'll probably go for a beer with him after this. So. <laughs> What do we mean by science? What do you mean by science? Uh, yo, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, I guess I mean uh, the, the, the thing that all these people in some sense or other are dumping on, which is a uh, notion of knowledge as about a self-regulating uh, nature that is knowable as an object relatively sharply distinguished from a knowing subject, right? And the constellation, historical formation of physics, biology, et cetera, that kind of is built on the basis of that understanding of the subject. Um, and it seems to me that implicit in all these is a kind of rejection, at least in some sense of the definition of time that comes out of the, the classical versions of those sciences, right? and maybe an alliance with a, a different form of time that may or may not be compatible with uh, scientific understandings. So that's what I was thinking about there. Right, that clarifies it. That clarifies your question for me then, it's not necessarily between sciences and humanities, or what sometimes called human sciences per se, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dominant model of thinking about subjects and objects and Therefore, space and time, which has pervaded much of the humanities, much of the much of the European humanities, and much of the sciences, and is is that is it is it is it that question rather like is it necessarily a, a sciences versus? Yeah, non- sure, sure. If you want, or or alongside subject object, also the distinguish distinction between natural regularity and spiritual freedom. Right, the distinction between sciences as having a regular, regulated nature and humanities as kind of accepting that vision and taking up the other side of the human experience, which is, you know, what we do with our agency, you know, histor- histor- our historicity and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the, so this human nature distinct dichotomy has been um, always been invoked in order to advance this civilizing mission over over what's considered to be you know the natural non-human um which is you know which is, has been linked to a to a model of space and a model a model of temporal progress and um all the dichotomies that uh that we've been talking about right so it pervades in, in a way it informs the notion of the human and thus the humanities in some sense. Okay, cool, thanks. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, a, it makes a great deal of sense to me, thanks. Matt, you have your mic off? Did you have something you wanted to contribute there? No, okay, super. Well, we're now at 4.02, which means uh, we've come to the conclusion of our, our two hour event. Um, and uh, uh, we, just as we wrap things up here, I'm, I'd like to turn things over to Chris Bracken uh, to conclude uh, 
um, uh, Rebecca's epic two week uh, uh, virtual visit with us. Um, but before I do so, I, I just wanna say thanks uh, to all of our panelists and our audience members and uh, to Chris and Karen for the opportunity uh, to participate today. This has been a, a, an immense pleasure for me. Um, and I really appreciate the, the brilliance that came to the table today. So thank you all very much. Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Mike. So I would just like to offer thanks to all the people who made this possible since October 2019, um, because this is actually, this visit has probably been in the planning since the early days of 2019. So I, for that purpose, have prepared a slideshow, which I conceive of as kind of like the credits in a film. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen if I can do that. And one of the reasons I want to do this is that, and Zoom is going to fight me here because Zoom is in the way of my PowerPoint here. Let me try this again. No, don't do that to me. Let's go. Just give me a minute here. It's becoming even worse than I thought. So Zoom is always in my way, blocking me when I want to do something. There we go. So um, one of the reasons I want to do a slideshow is that to give you the names of the people who've been working behind the scenes, these are the four people who have been basically attending every meeting and helping me set up this visit for a long time now. Um, while we were planning this, many of the people involved in planning did not know if they would continue to have jobs at the University of Alberta. While they were still being extremely professional, showing professionalism and helping me set up this visit anyway. Um, for example, the university did float the idea of collapsing or removing or closing the Arts Resource Center on which we are completely dependent for the past two weeks. So I'd like to thank Claire Grant, Diana, and Cindy for basically managing each one of these events. And Diane, sorry, I got your name wrong there, Diane. Diane, without a second A, um, has been helping me do planning and advertising for a long time now. And one of the curious things is nobody actually knows if this is their job in many cases because um, jobs, jobs have disappeared. People who used to help have quite a longer working at the University of Alberta. Um, job descriptions have been rewritten or haven't been rewritten yet. Um, we've been planning this in a state of really unbelievable chaos. Going back, a number of people have helped planning. So Karen Ball um, initially proposed this visit, issued the invitation to Rebecca and sketched out some of the events, including this event that we had today, the um, Colloquium on Temporality. Annette gouding Breuger used to be the lead person for Distinguished Visitors in the Department of English and Film Studies. And then in the middle of the year, this year, she basically, her job was rewritten and she was made graduate advisor in, in English and Film Studies in the Department of Philosophy. So she has helped a bit behind the scenes and she certainly helped a lot in the initial stages of planning and applying for funding. Marcy Warcott and Carol has been in the background doing some of the computer work, especially around advertising, web pages, that kind of thing. And also thank everyone who wrote letters supporting the original funding application way back in October 2019. Um, funding comes from the Distinguished Visitors Fund in the Office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation. Um, and I would thank the OBPRI and the DB Fund for their flexibility. Um, not only was a grant applied for, there were two amendments, which also had to be formally um, submitted as applications, including an application to convert an in-person visit, which we wanted to have into an online visit, which meant redirecting funds, um, basically re rewriting the entire grant and the entire event. Um, if you're Applying for a DB fund grant for the first time is a bit like trying to get to the castle in a certain novel by Franz Kafka. Um, you don't know how to get in the door. 
Um, so the Chair of English uh, Film Studies, Cecily Devereaux, and the Interim Dean of Arts, Steve Patton, um, were very helpful in helping me get, um, get the application to the appropriate office within the castle. Simply applying, seeing the application through the university takes at least two weeks after the application is submitted and it keeps coming back and back. Um, finally, I'd like to thank the bargaining team for the Academic Staff Association at the University of Alberta. One of the most bizarre and exasperating features of hosting this visit was that during this academic year, when Rebecca and I um, decided that we would switch to an online format as the various variants of the new coronavirus spiraled out of control, um, while we were planning this, I was convinced that the university staff would go on strike and this visit would be canceled. So I invite everyone to think about what it's like to meticulously plan a visit that you think is not going to happen. And if it had in fact been canceled, it would not have been possible, I think, to uncancel it. So I'm glad that we didn't go on strike and we only found that news out really a couple of weeks before events began. So finally, um, I'd like to thank Rebecca again for coming out and being such a good sport with all of the planning and all of the changes and all of the rewriting and all of the politics and all of the drama that went on um, literally for two and a half years. So that's it for me. Thanks again, Rebecca. Rebecca, if you have anything further to say as our visitor, I'll give you the last word. You're muted still. So Rebecca, you have to unmute. Can we unmute her? No, I have no way of unmuting her. If she can't, then she can't. <laughs> So Rebecca, we can't hear you. Maybe she can't hear you. You know, was, and I think that was an expression of thanks. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't I, I can't say it out loud. Um, and I hopefully I got that reasonably correct. Rebecca, I'm sorry, when I when I go over to try to unmute you, the more button comes up covering the thing that I would click to unmute you. Um, uh, okay. Her screen is is frozen, and and, if, and an effusive thanks for all of the great hosting that that Chris and everyone else has offered during uh, during Rebecca's time here. Rebecca, this was a wonderful wonderful couple of weeks. Thank you so much. It's really greatly appreciated, and we acknowledge your thanks as well. Too. Uh, Chris, I think that's it. If 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 you're yeah, um, thanks again, everyone, including panelists. Let me once again thank you for this great event. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>